Great. It's another fantastic evening, an amazing turnout. Um, thank you so much for coming. We have such incredible people here with us today and hopefully we also have Peter on Zoom. Perhaps we could, uh, well, we'll come to him in a moment. Now, yesterday, for, hello, Peter. <laughs> fantastic, I, I'll leave you there. Oh, actually, I'll leave you there, Ben, if we could leave Peter there until I do some introductions. I just wanted to sort of do a little bit of summing up from yesterday. I felt I felt um, I gave Schumann a very hard time about his pessimism. Um, I apologized afterwards, and he said, "Actually, I'm just a melancholic realist. And if if I understood, um, if I understood the nature of power and the systemic injustice that it represented, I would be pessimistic too." Fair enough. And certainly, as I told him, I have a friend who works in practice who says whenever he makes a piece of toast, he foresees the trajectory of doom. So I think, you know, out of that, I'm afraid to say that I'm still full of hope and wonder and a fascination in the world. Um, that's what kind of drives me every day. But I also think that's what drives us within education and within architecture. And there's a curiosity about how and when we have a conversation and what that conversation could be about. And I realized that these evenings are this tremendously selfish act of trying to really understand what the people around me, the people I have deep respect for, and all of you are really interested in. So this is just, I'm throwing down the cards. I hope for a good conversation. And I really hope that we can start to weave the strands of these different themes together, find their oppositions, and move forward. So... Um, Really, without further ado, I want to bring the these, this group of people, which perhaps are not easily extracted from one another thematically, um, to the table. Um, I'm going to start with Takeshi. Takeshi, you you are. I'm going to do these very briefly. Um, I think what's fantastic is I talked many months ago, no, a month or so ago, to Shin, and we were talking about family trees in the AA. And certainly, we have at least two of of. Uh, of Shin's offspring, I feel, with us this <laughs> evening. So here we've Guan, Guan Li, Takeshi Haitsu. Now, what's extraordinary is that I think that there's a sensitivity and a historicity the way in which you deal with material. So I think there's everything from the privilege of the award-winning primitive hut, which is a really delicate piece of beauty, um, through to, I, just, I was looking last night at your, your sort of, your bamboo, I want to call it bamboo bar meaning, but it's bamboo bara. But also, you know, Guan, you took this in a very different direction. So I'm kind of hoping this evening to begin to weave together the threads of where that thinking comes from, both from a sensitivity to material, to place, to a kind of context that weaves through to an understanding of perhaps what we should call history. Now, um, Shumi, I met you here, and you are, you are, you and I are the, the sort of women historians on the table. So um, we'll come to that as well. And I think with each of you, what I'd love if you add when you do your short introductions or whatever you'd like to add to the conversation by way of kickoff, a little bit of what your experience was here and what you've taken away from it, what you might have rejected as you've moved on. Um, David, we've known each other almost as long as Schumann and I have known each other. Um, you're one of the few people to visit me in Washington, D.C. and actually look at some architecture with me um, and have since obviously you know, gone on to, I think, weave a really interesting path through an understanding of a really good understanding of also the history of architecture and how that can be reinvented, reinterpreted and reformed through a variety of means. Now, Peter. Yes. <laughs> Peter can loom behind my head. Um, I gave my first I gave my first first year lecture today this morning. I started somewhere in the 19th century with William Morris and British Empires, but I probably had one of my first history lectures from Peter on Mesopotamia and wrote one of my first essays. I went on to write a dissertation on Washington DC, which eventually became a PhD, which at the time I think Peter was mainly geared around my impressions of lock jawed East, East Coasters and what that really meant for the way in which a place like Washington had formed. Um, I'm really happy to have you here. I think Peter's been part of my education for a tremendously long time. Um, and certainly with Schumann yesterday, I think we sat in your office with the very, trying to, trying to stay warm over the heater in those first few years. Which brings me to Mark. Mark, Mark Wigley, I think you need very little introduction, but I would like to say you gave the best introduction to yourself a few years ago, sitting around an examiner's table, which has been a model for us all. I think we'd all gone round and given our 
our CVs extensively and, and Mark turned to the room and he said, hi, I'm Mark, I'm from New Zealand and I teach in New York. I think you can't do better. So without giving a full CV of each of these fantastic characters, I'll let them introduce themselves and um, their connection to really what they think we're doing. I'll let them take this off in whatever di direction that they would like. And I'm going to, where am I going to start with? I'm going to start with some slides. Where are we going? So over to you, Guan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hello, I'm Guan. So uh, this is a photo of me, 1998. Uh, I was just about to start my fifth year with Shin and I decided that I wanted to do something that really somehow encapsulate my interest and love for material. And I picked a big bag of plaster and I tried to hold it after it's mixed with water that I tried to hold it and it's liquid and you know it, it took a while to, to try to capture it and eventually it got a little bit more viscous and I could hold a bit more and, and at some point it just turned a little bit warm and then I let go and there's a, just a lump of plaster. So let's say I have a thing for materials, <laughs> especially when it's, uh, you know, in the process of transformation and that's sort of, yeah, and then I took that with me, you know, and in what I do, my research and my practice. The thing is, you know, so that's the lump of plaster when it's released. Do I go through? I think you might be worth just saying something a little bit about also where that's gone and what okay, you're doing now. Okay, sure. Um, so then from there, just idea of casting being uh, held by something flexible, like a person, uh, led to this particular area of work where I looked at fabric as a formwork. So it's a flexible formwork. It takes its shape when the fabric is filled. And, and this is the work that I produce well, as part of my PhD and it's set at Grimstike Farm, which is where my practice is. So I, I run a research practice just outside of London in Buckinghamshire. And so this was the first project. And I guess because it's, a, it's going to be my slide still next, I guess. Um, so that was the, I call that the first one was the, the, <clears throat> the material that's held with the flexible mold. And in this particular case, so the next two slides um, shows, um, in a way, I took, I got rid of the mold and I looked at the material itself as something that's just being formed by, uh, you know, constant engagement. So mm -hmm. in this sense, you know, when you cast something, it's, it wants to be fixed. But the thing is with wet clay, which is actually underneath the ground in Grimstake Farm, it's wet clay and you can form it, but you, you can't really fix it unless you fire it. So the thing is, in order for it to stay like this, you would have to caress it endlessly every day, keep it wet. So yeah, so that was kind of the, this is the conclusion of my introduction. So it's a series of, trying to understand how to fix material. I think just one very small point, you know, we had this conversation very briefly about Hook Park, which obviously is constructing things out of timber. And it's about, you know, the almost as little as one can do to make something. And I think you have a very different set of processes at Grimstite Farm, um, both mechanical, both digital, and very, very physical that also work with the substance on the ground. I've had the pleasure of doing kind of crits for you at the RCA and, you know, to build a brick, brick kiln within the ground to really experiment with not just the fluidity of materials, but their, when they become solid, like, like, sure. like a yeah. baked mm -hmm. element. But it's a very different thing, this kind of construction and the subtraction or the things that come out of the earth. And I think that's a fascinating thing to offset against some of the things that are happening already in places like Hood Park. But I'll bring Takeshi, if it's okay, I'll bring your slides in as well. Uh, yes, so I came to the UK uh, 1993. I came here 
to study. That was the reason why I came to the UK. I wasn't thinking to stay this long. <laughs> um, I really had no plan. Um, but uh, somehow, yeah, almost nearly 30 years, and next year is going to be the 30th anniversary for me. Um, so through this, I came here because I was really attracted to Archigram. I was so inspired when I was in Tokyo, and that was all the kind of UK movement. Um, but um, since I've been here too long, somehow my interest moved back to my own country in Japan. So I tried to go back to, to, to Japan at least once a year. Um, a bit disrupted by COVID, but managed to go back this summer, which was great. And then I also started to visiting sort of buildings in, in there because I wanted to actually learn about Japan, Japanese architecture. I didn't know anything about Japanese architecture while I was there. Uh, so, so this is the temple. Um, it's uh, uh, the, the, it's called Nageiredo. It's a part of the temple complex in Yamagata Prefecture in Japan. This is one of the probably highlight of my visit to, to those kind of uh, historic buildings in Japan. Um, it's uh, it's quite a journey to get there. It's about two weeks. It's the sort of middle of the Norway in the mountain on a cliff, kind of parched into the cliff. Um, sort of a half cave kind of a dwelling, half sort of a, it's called Kengai Zukuri. It's a sort of timber lattice supporting the jetting out of the, of the timber building. Um, and the it's a part of the Shingon Mikyo. It's a sort of Buddhist sect that uh, so combines the uh, Shintoism, uh, shamanism, and also Japanese folk um, animism. Um, so it's quite a magical place. Um, so, so really sort of learning uh, from, I guess, outsider's view about my own country and then sort of taking uh, in these kind of uh, inspirations, I guess. This is uh, what's so fascinating about this is that uh, there's a myth about, you know, this monk actually build this structure and throw it into the cliff. Um, by their supernatural power. But uh, I can see sort of how the stilts sits onto the cliff, on, on the rocks that almost sort of uh, improvising um, on site. I can feel that. And they also, it's interesting that these kind of lengths of the, the, the stilts sort of measuring the, the, the sort of shape of the natural formation of the rock. So, so the architecture become a sort of a framing, framing of the nature. And this is a kind of a happy marriage of uh, nature and man-made. So I don't know, this history and material, I can sort of uh, make a, a story about this, but, you know, this sort of, a, you know, the rock formations, you know, millions of years. And then this temple was built in uh, 8th century uh, in, in Japan. So it really sort of old. Anyway, let's move on to the next. Um, so... Then this uh, picture, this is not my picture. Um, it's in Kyoto. Uh, it's part of the well. It's again in, in, the, in, the, in the temple complex. This is a quite well-known uh, timber joint called Kanawatsugi. I think you, in this country use this uh, similar joint too. It's used for uh, often the repair of this uh, timber structure, especially sort of bottom of the timber column where is exposed to the to the water that the rain is splashing back. So you you see this sort of a repair technique in in everywhere in Japan, usually timber to timber. Um, in this case, yeah, they, they probably fed up, keep repairing it, so change to granite. Uh, what's beautiful about this joint is that you can repair the structure without dismantling the whole thing. You can just sort of slot in while sort of propping the rest of it. Uh, but yeah, this is a quite sort of inspirational image that, you know, this, uh, this I call it sort of bath of architecture, almost, sort of a transforming one material to the other. So it's a bit like a sort of a Greek column, the theory was that, you know, there was original timber, but uh, there's a sort of remaining of the, uh, the forms that, the, the, um, in, in stone. Uh, next. 
Then uh, this is the picture taken by a vanguard artist, Genpei Akasegawa, 1972. He called it, this is his hyper art, uh, Thomason, number one. This is, uh, they discovered this sort of a street observation uh, uh, recording, this kind of a uh, subconscious or unconscious sort of a phenomena that happens in the city that uh, it's basically remaining of uh, something that becomes uh, unusable or useless, uh, but still there. And what's interesting about this picture that he points out that you see the white bit of the balustrade. So even this staircase became redundant or useless because pr probably there's a door there that somehow changed to the window. But somebody was keeping it. Somebody's actually maintaining it to, to repair that bit of broken balustrade. And uh, why you do that? So that was the sort of his point. You know, there's a, the art is in this. So, I mean, this, um, this is in Tokyo somewhere. Uh, that's what doesn't exist anymore. So these things are quite uh, short-lived, um, but still, I guess it's part of the history. Sorry. This is my presentation. <laughs> That's great. No, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going and then we can open the, the conversation. Right. <clears throat> That's David. me. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I thought I'd choose this image partly because uh, half of my career in independent practice has been doing this project and uh, the theme of very long spans. <laughs> um, and I suppose history material certainly have been issues. It's a, it's a new addition to a college in Oxford and it's shoehorned between lots of existing buildings, um, all of which are protected. And in a way, the, the challenge of the, the building was to um, prize out of a situation in which there was no prospect of expanding the college uh, that that much opportunity for housing students. And I, I think what the bit that I've found most um, remarkable in the last seven years, um, and it's, it's it explains something of my relationship to the school um, of starting a seminar series, The Future of Collaboration in a week, is how dependent uh, the design is on all of the other um, ma makers, uh, stakeholders, uh, and an example is, so this timber roof, uh, which has been such a pleasure to work on, uh, started its life as a tiled roof that had to have a particular vault, uh, which survived as far as a, a planning application, which took three years, uh, at which point the, the pitch of the vault wasn't sufficient to work structurally, and it became a concrete vault. And then we worked with a lot of new people, uh, which again, we had to understand the kind of history of vaults. And, and this shape is very much, um, it's both about the building, but also about knitting the different roof lines of all the surrounding uh, structures. So it's very much operating at an urban level as much as an architectural one. But the, the, the concrete roof at a certain point uh, bit the dust and you'd like to think it bit the dust, perhaps because too much carbon um, or, or some such. But in fact, it bit the dust because there weren't enough people in the UK that could build such a structure. And so it became a risk item on a schedule. And the much more interesting and seemingly appropriate in 2022 timber solution only came about because the contractor could find more people to service that supply chain. And I found this fascinating that for all my fist uh, bumping on the, on the, uh, the, in the meetings with the college about what they should and shouldn't do and which materials they should and shouldn't uh, use. And uh, you know, architects declare, have, you know, we're all pitching for these kind of solutions. It was actually a, a contractor supply chain that, that drove the, the whole project. And it then meant that we went to Switzerland and there were some uh, AA graduates working in Switzerland on advanced uh, computation for designing how all of these pieces would fit together 
And then again, and one of the greatest pleasures was the, the piece of software in order to minimize the amount of packaging so that it could be brought to the UK in the fewest number of containers. And all of these slight adjustments to the process made it that much more viable. And it then went on to win a Carbon Champion Award, which was you know, really the doing of the contractor and the client uh, rather than ours, uh, but purely as a consequence of all of these other processes. And I suppose yeah, my take on the question of, of, of history and material is, is these relationships um, one has with, uh, in this case, particularly makers and how instrumental they are in ways that you wouldn't expect and, and the level of pragmatism one has to engage with in order to pursue ideals. Um, and I think that probably the second image, so I have two images. This is a, another campus. And I think we, during the seven years, we were able to pitch the idea we were already doing an education building. So we, we pitched this in Belgium and it's collaborating with a local uh, practice, Bovenbau. Uh, and it's right next to Francesca Torzo's Z33, uh, extraordinary building. And it's, it's a historic beguinage, which is kind of almost like almshouses. Um, and this whole complex, which is at the heart of the city, uh, was due to be converted into flats. And so the city, in a last-ditch attempt, uh, tried to repurpose it for a more public function. And in order to do that, um, the competition proposal we made, which won, was to insert a tower, uh, which is this... Uh, brick figure, because on the site, um, up until the Second World War, there was a church which was the tallest building in the town, and everyone knew the site, and it was known because it was visible from the entire surrounds. And um, the tower inserted is the same height as the church that was demolished, and it was this that unlocked all of the local um, stakeholders who had strong opinions about the future of this site into supporting it out of, you know, gradually there were people who were old enough or had found out from the history books enough about this site. And so I guess this question of history material and the, the possibility of repurposing this historic fabric was only made possible through a means which was not at all evident. And, uh, and maybe that's it's these kind of very circuitous routes to, to, to finding a way through to making architecture that perhaps I wanted to bring to this evening. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm enjoying this kind of transition between the sort of sensual, almost the provisional, the accidental, and then the sort of accident of the supply chain, which is absolutely <laughs> fantastic. I think last night we were talking about the question of supply chains. I think this is you, Mark. Oh. So a slight shift of direction. No, it's the same. Oh, it's the same. <laughs> Central and provisional. <laughs> yes, I study this diagram uh, for a few minutes and then I'll examine you on it. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, after Schumann's eloquence last night, I thought um, I should make some notes. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for the invitation to, to be here with, with you all. And, and uh, you all, like there's a lot of people in the room, energizing this room, which is a magical room. So I was very happy to come just for, to be in this room tonight, as I would always be. Um, although it seems kind of impossible to be in this room to talk about history without my cousins, or to talk about anything, actually. So I sort of feel like this is a slightly illegal conversation, uh, even illicit, unforgivable conversation. Um, at least his name is on the door. So maybe uh, he's here, but just to note this. And... Um, also to be here in this moment, which feels like the beginning of something, right? Which is exciting, um, really super exciting. And um, I think this difficulty of talking about history, I mean, um, the problem of Mark Cousins is the problem of the ghost, right? And the trouble with this room is there are so many ghosts. <laughs> so all the students are here because so much happened in this room over the decades, maybe it's 175 years when you celebrate. Um, but that's a, also a problem, right? Because then what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to live up to these ghosts, especially the ghosts of the 1970s, which sort of 
so they're hanging here, you know. Um, so, and maybe that's the problem with history altogether, right? That's it's, it, that it's kind of like a burden. And of course, as a member of the historians' union, I want to claim that history is fun and interesting. Uh, the ghosts are actually by far the most interesting uh, companions for 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 many reasons. Um, and so just to take on your kind of binary of the his history and material, right? I mean, history classically is the past, goes on in the archive, the library, and the seminar room. And materials is so much, seems to be normally so much to do with the present, goes on in the field, in the laboratory, and, in, and then in the design studio. And we often even think of schools sort of divided between rooms that are good for history and rooms that are good for material, and they all have backup rooms. You know, there's a whole infrastructure. So this is a magic room, but... It's sort of surrounded by other rooms that make it possible, right? Um, and of course, I think I would argue there's no discussion about material that's not also a discussion about history. And craft itself, craft with material, produces narratives, produces stories. And I think we already heard it super eloquently. Um, and it's not like you, it's not like you switch gear, like okay, because I told you this story about plaster. Now I'm going to speak. Historically, somehow some kind of history is made or some new history, historia, story, some new story emerges from the plaster and not, it's not leaving the plaster behind. Uh, it's somehow unthinkable or thought through the plaster, right? The same must be true of history, that history is always a kind of invention. It's actually always about the future. Watch out for historians. Yeah. They are the ones that rob you because they say they're just talking about the past and watch out because they really got their eye on the future. They're all moralists, right? Every historian, she will always be with a, you know, an ethic that you're supposed to follow. Whereas the architects, the practice practitioners just say, I'm just making stuff. So they kind of say, I'm, I'm free of, you know, that stuff. So watch out for historians. But this dance between history and material is very complex, and I think it is a dance. Maybe dance is just a word for complexity and so on, but it's a dance in which the two sides of the couple can't ever, and couple doesn't sound like enough, like a much more polygamous or multidimensional than this, but you can't separate the, the, the pieces of it. You can't sort of do one and then um, address the, the, the other. So there would be, anyway, multiple dances at any one time. Um, so I think uh, getting back to this room, what makes it magical is not what happens in it. It's never what happens in it, but what arrived here from somewhere else and what leaves here, whose effects we might not understand. I mean, one way to understand this room is it's kind of a loudspeaker. It's a way of tuning into what's going on in the world of architecture. It's not that necessarily anything is invented here. But this is a place in which you can kind of efficiently learn, listen to What's, what's cooking. Maybe this is not a cooking, no, there's no, no cooking going on here. It may not even matter, even the most exciting thing that happens in a school of architecture, that doesn't really matter. What matters is what happens afterwards. And it seems to me as teachers, our responsibility is to uh, ideas that the students didn't have yet. You kind of create a hospitality to what hasn't happened, right? So it's never what happens actually in this room, but sort of what might happen afterwards and what happened um, before, So you could think of this room as a kind of part of a kind of circuitry. It's a sort of a node or something. Uh, um, and, in, in that, and in that sense, uh, I myself walked into this room in 1985, I think it was. And I went upstairs and went to Nigel Coates's review from his un of his unit that was he'd taken over from Bernard Schumi, whose unit he was originally in and then assisted in. And Alvin Bioski was, oh, Oh, I'm not supposed to mention the 70s, right? Because that's like, that's the big burden. But see, I'm trying to tell you, like, as a historian, I'm going to tell you about the 70s because that would be the point, that it's fun, actually, to, to engage with these ghosts. So Alvin was there, and I got to know those two people, Nigel and Alvin, later and different things. But it was very important for me to listen to that conversation that was going on um, at that at that time. When you think of the 70s, this school is famous for its kind of experimental biodiversity of design, right? And that's associated with the vertical units and all of this. I don't really hear too much people talking about the biodiversity of history. That is a huge part of the AA, was always a huge part of the AA, and was a really big part of the AA in the 70s. And you could say, oh, yeah, you're one of those. You want to say you're so important. You guys know nobody has any fun without the historians and so on. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> So, so there was a sort of a biodiversity of history. Also, think about it. Think of, uh, you know, Rem Callhouse is a historian or a designer. 
right? Isn't it something like a writer who becomes a designer in order to become a writer? Didn't, isn't there in the invention of a new kind of history there? Isn't that what, what the project is, a kind of invention of a new kind of history which already suggests produces or is um, uh, uns- inseparable from a certain kind of design? Think about Robin Evans, right? Does his graduates from here in something like 1969 doing a thesis on piezoelectric materials, material, a new kinds of material, ends up doing a PhD with Joseph Rickward, uh, comes back here eventually and so on. So it, it isn't Robin Evans like not, the word historian is inadequate to that, but it's an architect in, in, in every possible um, way. And by the way, of course, the vertical unit system preceded the 70s. So you don't have to get so worried. It didn't even come from the 70s. 70s just ripped off previous moment. Uh, And maybe we could go to that moment with a few slides and then I'm done. So this is a drawing by, by Charles Jenks from 1969. One of the people who was teaching inside that first drawing I showed you was Charles Jenks. That was the drawing of how history would be integrated into the school when there was the vertical units, like how do you take control of history when you have what the director at that time called a kind of uh, a democracy of educational democracy, student initiated kind of occupation of the school. In 69, uh, in 65, Jenks is a tutor here at the school, um, a year before the arrival of that kind of administration. And in 69, he does this drawing, which is a kind of a manifesto uh, moving on. It's a manifesto for biodiversity. It's a manifesto for multiple dances. It's also a kind of, it, it is first published by the Architectural Association quarterly at the beginning of 1971. It's, I would say it's an anti-eugenic manifesto. It's all about a kind of, it's a very non-hierarchical uh, uh, kind of position. It is also perhaps a manifesto for postmodernism that will not yet be named as such until 1975. So it's kind of really full on manifesto, but it's an architectural drawing. You could say it's a landscape drawing, but clearly he's giving shape to history itself. Shape is an interior and not just any interior. It's a kind of archigram blobby inflatable. This is the inflatable moment, right? 69. So this is like treating history like the most exciting biotechnical project, right? Moving along. But the AA also makes a poster out of it in 1971, kind of uh, ecologically green because it's sort of environmental. And it's a teaser for the book. Uh, uh, the book hasn't come out yet, produced by Studio Vista and then moving on along again. And it keeps going and going. This is the 2000 version. Uh, and this is 2011. It never stops, right? There are like 30 different versions. So what I'm trying to say is something like this. Jenks sort of came in from the, from the outside from the United States, started to hang around. He was a student of Rainer Banham, and he starts to operate within the AA. So much does he absorb the AA that he's actually the one who's reporting to the council on the school community urgent desire to replace the previous regime with a voting regime. So the kind of like d- d- democratic principles that organize this place were represented at that time by Jenks, who just like everything British absorbed, absorbed and absorbed. So any, any sort of thought that history writing is somehow detached from sort of material production and political engagement is um, somewhat ridiculous. And then, and then Jenks goes on, this thing goes on. I, I don't think Jenks really did this drawing. I think this drawing really did him. This is sort of like he had to feed this thing all the time. This is like the drawing, the drawing that ate architecture and certainly ate. Uh, um, um, so it's not about heroic figures. So it's sort of about the fact that the AA was such a place in which somebody could, as it were, disturb the way we think about history sufficiently. You will have noticed in the first drawing, students had to learn about that tradition and then that modern movement. And then Jenks was about the modern movements. It was all about pluralism. It's all about hy- hybridity. Then he, in a way, never leaves the AA, right? He's teaching here for about 20 years, I think. But somehow this thing has a life of its own. I think that's the, the, and I finish with one last anecdote, which is by chance on the hottest day in the history of London, I was in London and Beatrice and I had the pleasure of being, of being in Peter Salter's uh, only residential uh, project, which is like AA, it's like AA on steroids. It's like the Uber, it's the Uber proof that all the experiments done here have nothing to do with what's really going on out there, except it is out there and it's fantastic. I have to just report to you from the bedroom of the uh, warmer. So I, again, the point, my point would be something like what really matters is not what necessarily 
what Peter Solder was saying when he was here, or all those many, many students that he was influencing. But some kind of disturbance took place, and it's a disturbance to history. And you can sleep in there, I think. <laughs> I think that's an excellent answer to some of the conversations yesterday. Certainly the yeah. question from the student that we had. I'm listening to you all um, and realizing that there is a bit of a family um, affair going on because I think, uh, I mean, I'm speaking now just like Mark would have spoken to lots of us. Uh, thank you uh, for bringing in Mark Cousins. It does feel a bit weird to not see him outside smoking and to crash a cigarette off him before I'm, before I'm in here too. Um, but Mark always used to speak without slides. I don't think I ever saw Mark speak without with slides, right? I don't think I ever saw him speak with any kind of visual material. So I'm riffing on him today, doing the same thing. Um, I guess I, uh, Ingrid, I don't know if I'd call myself a historian. I've kind of um, finagled my way around any kind of definition. I spend most of my time teaching. Um, I don't know if that makes me a historian, but um, one of the reasons that I didn't go into practice was, um, and this is really between me and my therapist, but it is a family affair, um, a horror of putting material in the world, absolute abject horror of putting material in the world, matched only by a fascination of making sense of what material there is in the world and how many stories you can tell about it. So I think um, I did write down some notes and now I can't read them. Um, I think what's been interesting in my career, I suppose, since coming, since being educated at BAA um, by not only by Mark Cousins, but by Marina Lathuri, Brett Steele, all of you, I realize how much, how many of my ideas I've borrowed from all of you, the whole history story thing that I still give to my first year's mark that's directly indebted to you. And as is my insistence that history is fun um, and funny as well as fun, um, I guess. So materiality and material in its physical sense, the way we might understand it is, um, I think much more problematic to think about now than it was even when I was studying, which isn't that long ago, but um, I don't think concerns around how much material we're putting in the world and what the fuck we're gonna do with it um, was that heavy on my mind when I had that instinctive horror. Um, and I think the horror and the decision to look at stories and stay in history was a sort of refuge for me because I could say, well, I'm not in practice. I don't have a practice. I just talk about it. I just tell stories about it. Um, at least that's the refuge I used to take until I realized that, of course, telling stories is a practice and it is still putting stuff into the world and it does still produce material. It's all material. Um, if you think about material, not just as this stuff. I was in a, a sort of discussion earlier today um, hosted by the CCA called How to Do No Harm as Architects, How to Do No Harm. Um, you might want to uh, look at it. Speaking to what you, uh, how you began, Ingrid, it was a little bit, um, I guess the tone of things were, was a little bit dejected at times. <laughs> we were looking for hope, but in a practice like architecture, how to do no harm seems like um, an impossible task. And, you know, with harm being something that is subjective, I suppose, um, it's hard, try as we might, to consider how we might practice with doing no harm. And so we also concluded that discussion looking for hope. Um, my rather glib answer, I can't really disagree with it though. Um, as an historian, as somebody who teaches history, um, as somebody who was taught history in this building and then had the pleasure of teaching history in this building immediately after I graduated, <laughs> um, I guess I find my hope in students. Certainly I wouldn't have made it through the pandemic um, without my students, I don't think I would be able to come back to work without my students and without my eagerness to see them. My hope resides in them. Um, I think when I started teaching, I was very much, uh, like I said, it was just after I finished my um, history studies here. And I thought, well, I could be a big sister to the students. It's fine. I'm not that different from them. And now I'm definitely reaching, reaching auntie age. 
and leaning heavily into I'm happy being an auntie telling stories and seeing maybe a grandmother telling stories. That's absolutely fine. Um, I hope in students, I only noted, um, does land heavily, you know, we can think about, you know, the children, the future and everything. But when I talk about hope with my students, I see this sort of ominous dust clouds rising from what they've inherited as my hope lands on their shoulders. So I think, um, I don't know, uh, in terms of immaterial things like hope and um, funny things like ghosts, I guess all I'd want to say is that in, in, my, own, um, in my own sort of journey of claiming a practice, um, even though it is immaterial, uh, and riffing on what Mark was saying, it's not just what you take from it while you're at this building, it's not just what you take from the AA as um, somebody who's interested in architecture, because this school does transcend the educational into public and, and much more. But I think it's also what you bring to it, and I specifically um, address this to all the students. Of course you mustn't be burdened by ghosts of the 70s, come and dance with them if you like or don't, bring your own voice to it. There's so much more to tell. And there's so many, many more voices um, and so many ways to tell it. And it all makes material for our critical consideration. So I think that's that's where I'll stop for now and hope that Peter is with us. Thank you so Thanks. much, Shumi. Thank you. How are we doing back there? Good, okay. Peter, can we hear you? Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, we've got some sort of communication. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, for the sake of the audience, I my main connection with the AA, other than friends of, um, was as an external examiner, which I did for 20 years. I, I began... <clears throat> um, when people like Robin Evans was teaching and finished in, I think about year two of the AADRL. Um, and I stopped when I realized I had been examining longer than most of the students had been alive. Um, when this was posed to me, or I saw the notices, I said history and material, they're very abstract. History of what, material of what. And I said one of the ways in which people used to put this together was through the notion of style, which of course is utterly bankrupt. Um, but if you, know, you were doing neo-Romanesque, you people expected some stone, for example. Correlatively, it's a considerable mystery to me that steel and glass retains this weird um, futuristic optimism, you know, a hundred years in. And if the style has become, as Mark has eloquently demonstrated, the collection of Jenks's isms, um, I began to think about kinds of temporality, which I, I don't hold to uh, history as such, or time as such, but think of them all as very concrete, and I'm not going to go into that. But what I'd like to suggest is that what's going on in an 18th century Baroque interior is almost entirely stucco. Um, the pews aren't, and the floor isn't, but everything else is a variety of stucco, um, from the walls to sculpture to moldings and ornament uh, to stucco lustro, um, and augmented by fresco and coloring of the marbles and so forth. And this kind of thing invokes a transcendent condition connected to Christianity at the apex via all the cascade of um, saints and local figures that you see in the frescoes or in the sculpture. 
down through the, all the trades and, and arts that made it out into the fields and the cycles of seasons and their connection to the religious cycles and so forth. Um, one could say vis-a-vis -vis material and a kind of architecture that Lisitsky's Prown of 1923 uh, does something similar. It is, the, from a material point of view, it's nothing but collections of pieces of wood mounted on white screens. And you're meant to stand inside and find yourself in a very different kind of transcendent condition. Um, it doesn't really have a background. In fact, it's trying to efface the background. So it's in that sense, a kind of opposite of style, even if it's become um, an ism um, in the Jenks um, history. Um, but what I am suggesting is that the metaphoricity of both the Baroque interior and the Prown open conditions of temporality as such. And if the weakness of the Prown is that it's all done by one person, it doesn't have this whole community behind it. And this all done by one person is the name of the game of all the most of the isms. At most, you get five, 10 people connected to it or an organism like Siam. Um, and yet we have these huge cities in which very little of the architecture is done by architects. And many of the concerns or interests of architects managed to find their way into development. But if you know, you look at a city like Jakarta, where there are little enclaves that are familiar from the West, and the rest is a kind of metabolism of survival, of making deals at a very personal level. The imbalance and, you know, the kind of environmental injustice that the global North has inflicted on the global South makes one think that the kind of metabolism, I mean, I'm not looking for another, an alternative to an 18th century Baroque interior, but I am looking for a kind of cultural metabolism that allows for a kind of hope that's other than, you know, radical effacement of what went before and is a communicative order that has its roots in our obligations to the fundamental natural conditions. And I hope that made it from Lecce Peter, thank you. I think that's an interesting place to start is that question of responsibility. And we came to this, you know, a little bit yesterday, I believe, because I think that perhaps the weight of the ghosts in this room, the weight of the sort of the dust on the shoulders of your students, Shumi, to a certain extent, many of the ways in which we practice feel like a means of escape or a means of confronting what seem to be intractable problems piece by piece. And I think you, you find various means by which to do so. I'm kind of curious to sort of bring the conversation back together and also um, ask for some contributions from our very enthusiastic audience. Javier, you're... you're... Uh, look, <laughs> I've got to thank Mark, right? Because I was here. In 1973, 74. <laughs> so I'm contemporary with Nigel, Moison, Homer, and um, uh, everyone, right? Now, I, I thank you very, very much because at that stage, we didn't make any sense. We knew we didn't make any sense. And we couldn't care that we didn't make any sense. We were doing our bit. But now you come along and you true proof to everyone that we were making sense. So thank you very much. But my contribution is very straightforward. You know, is that I think that I've been defining architecture as the materialization of an idea or a concept. And I think that my view is that really architecture is the materialization of history. 
Now, you take that. <laughs> well, maybe I didn't hear Peter correctly, but I thought one of the things that Peter said, or I, Peter, did you say that history is what material has? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> um, carry on. That's well, I thought that was a brilliant. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was the most beautiful uh, provocation in a way. Because if you're on the side of materials, then you, if materials are exactly that which has history, and I think so much about the presentations, it was immediately about the history, the rock versus the monks, so on and so on, about the seven years on the project, about how long I could hold this thing before it hit the floor. And then you use this incredibly beautiful word, I released it, like a, like a dove, and instead of it flying out the way, poof. <laughs> so I think this is just the idea that material it's not just to say that material has history because that's less strong, right? That my misunderstanding, Peter, is that is that you were saying that history is what material has. So that would be a, a, a reason for for studying that. The, the, the sort of vague attempt to answer the question would be, and and to think about what Ingrid's saying is that, of course, I think history is fun, but uh, that's a kind of a euphemism. History is also the um, uh, is if, if history and material are so intimately tied together, we don't even have to refer to historical materialism, the very idea of refusing a distinction between history and material, but history carries with it all, all of the full force of exclusions, dominations, violence, and so on. So one of the reasons for having fun with history is to take responsibility, uh, to understand that it's not, uh, you, you, we cannot in insulate ourselves and every time we open our mouths, the most ordinary description of an object or a place of an object in time or the way the object is constructed very, very likely uh, reinforces or is complicit with, or is the very means by which certain kinds of exclusions are launched. So I think for me, a little bit, one of the kind of vague points here was not, um, was to understand that, that, that his history is, as it were, directly political. It's not a matter of saying, I have, I have a political position and now I want to do a history that's consistent with that. Now there's a specific politics of history itself, which needs to be faced and to encounter. Then it's not necessarily historians who have, as it were, I, one of the points of this is, right? It's not, history is not, and it was so beautiful when you said, I'm not sure I would call myself historian, nor would any of us really want to if what I just said is true, right? Uh, history doesn't, as it were, belong to historians, but there, there's a sort of a caretakership there of one, one or two dimensions of it. But I think the urgent call would be to do a kind of history which is very sensitive to exclusions and, and, and exclusions through, through naming. As we all know, naming is pretty much the worst thing you can do to someone or to something. And, you know, um, just to make a final comment, I, th I think that what interests me about Jenks's drawing is primarily it's organized as around the dominance that fascism had on so-called modern architecture for three decades. That's the point of that drawing is to say, architects were fully complicit with fascism and biodiversity in architecture was reduced down to three little strands. So this document is political. People are not inclined to see Jenks in political terms. So I'm just saying one can see that it's exactly what it was and not necessarily an accident that he along with Peter Cook and a few others were in that group that was trying to help negotiate the political transformation at the AA towards a participatory, explicitly about a participatory uh, democracy, which led to the new constitution, which led to the hiring of the 1970s. Well, hiring speech. of the 1970s. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah. when they hired Alvin, they got yeah. uh, a whole lot of other stuff attached to him. Yeah. Perhaps I, can, I want to jump in on this idea that uh, material as history. So let's say I'm on the material camp. Yeah. Um I get when I say material I mean and I mean matter, let's say. And if we can and, and, and matter has a relationship with time and yeah and if we can't extricate let's say you know the error of time from materials from matter, then in a way the material itself is kind of a clock. It it tells time in a way. I guess I just want to make a little point about you know, something that I'm particularly interested in, for example, in casting. So 
before the invention of photography, you know, prior to 1839, a lot of the uh, his, a lot of historical buildings were cast. You know, we see a lot of that a lot of that in the, you know still in the VNA uh, cast room, and they you know we bring back you know for example there is a there is the west portico of the cathedral in uh, Santiago de Compostela that is still sitting in you know the uh, at the at the VNA. Uh, the thing is that some of it was it was impossible to bring back because of the pieces and the technique of the casting. But a lot of it was still there. A lot of the details were still there. And what's interesting is that the one in the VNA is somehow stuck in that period. I think that one was particularly, that particular one was cast in 1867. And, you know, in a way that texture now it's aged differently because it's been inside the VNA. And you know, I, I just wanted to make this point about how, in a way, material and history in, in this very sort of intimate and direct way, mm. you know, I mean, so yeah, that's 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 kind of my uh, provocation in terms of whether or not, you know, matter, uh, you know, in a way is, you know, kind of history. Mm. Mm. Peter, I think that comes back to your uh, your Baroque example. Just well, there, if I could jump in for just two seconds, um, one thing does seem to be prevalent is that the architecture is the embodying half of, you know, ideas, thought, um, concepts, and I'm not so sure that is a useful metaphor. One of the reasons I think of time or temporality is concrete. I mean, the temporality of a brick is very different from the temporality of a fly. Um, we can go on from there if, if we have to. But it's also the case that embodiment, which is something, and certainly phenomenology has relied, is much more mysterious than simply being the heavy half of, you know, or the visible half of the invisible or something like that. And um, I would, we, we, if we want to, we can carry on, but I, I would just suggest that um, the temporality is concrete and the embodiment is metaphoric. The second thing I would say is that one of the things that really made this 70s strong was the emphasis on city. And that was the debates about city meant you had to have a larger metabolism in play than just the magical architectural object. Um, the last thing I would say is that Robin Evans coined the phrase when he was confronted with kind of um, postmodernism on one hand and Oma futurism on the other, that he referred to a kind of symmetry of nostalgias for the future and for the past. And maybe nostalgia is one of those things that, you know, only tourists are supposed to have. But I think there, I think he undersold what the the nature of the attachment and the interpretive depth that's required for either of those. I think um, if it's just a style, yes, it is nostalgia. But very few people actually practice it that way. Even the people who do, you know, nasty classical stuff or, you know, casino entries. Very few people actually practice it that way. Even the people who do, you know, quite weird. Did everyone hear that properly? Okay. If not, carry on. <laughs> you were you were you're slightly interrupted by a motorbike. But um That's about right. Other <laughs> it'd be good to have a, a next question or a comment from the audience. Irene. Um maybe two comments. I mean one which is um I, I am not sure that the assumption that history is being made principally in schools of architecture is correct. Um, and I, um, I think that David, for instance, gave an example where um, you, you 
which suggests that some aspects of history, how we understand, for instance, the evolution of some aspects of architecture is simply being forged outside through circumstance and that historians are trying to tell that story. But I think the question is who actually control that story? So that's, that's just a, um, um, a side point. Um, see, I really like the theme of that session, material and history. And partly for that, for the reasons that I think that the scale at which it's a, it's a time scale at which we architects are um, thinking about our work is in the process of increasing very greatly. Um, and um, one of the reasons for this, I think, is that increasingly. Um, material and design are tied at the hip. And that it is an issue which increasingly we cannot avoid. And one of the consequences for this, because materials come from nature, that we cannot se separate on the one hand what could be uh, architectural history and on the other natural history. And I think that this point was partly made by in his own inimitable way by Takeshi and also in some respect by Guan. And so if I were to make a plea as um, for the way we think of architecture history, it is to actually think on a much broader scale than we have until recently. My education, uh, architecture history started in the 18th century, ended up you know, uh, with modernism. I think nowadays, I think many people in this room, I would have thought, are thinking over 2,000 years, 4,000 years. Um, and it, I'm sure it has implication on how we are going to write uh, the story of our pr profession. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I'm, I'm, the moment of trying to work out you know, we have a whole conversation about history and theory teaching here, what should be taught, how it should be taught, what do we learn from it? So, I mean, this is part of the, part of the purpose of having a conversation like this this evening, the duration of that, the question of temporality of embodiment. And then also, you know, the, what's interesting actually is that uh, the Jenks goes from being these sort of inflated bubbles to looking diaphanous like your ghosts, but mm -hmm. in that they get strung out, maybe get perhaps overly inflated until the relationship between them becomes much less meaningful, I think, than, than they did in their original diagram. Yeah, well, he went through a high, sort of high-tech period. Mm. <laughs> I didn't show you the, <laughs> the crisp geometric ones. I, I mean, a couple of things. I don't think anybody here is suggesting that history is made by historians in schools of architecture. Mm. I think a little bit. Mm. That's why I was trying to say you can think of this room as, as absorbing wider. But I think your point is so important important. I, I can only add a couple of things. I don't think there's any assumption that it's a human history that we are discussing, which is sort of implied in, in your um, saying that nature cannot be as it was separated. I, I think uh, Neolithic would be considered too short a time frame for a lot of uh, a lot of thought. And certainly um, genetic and bacteriological and kind of trans species work is really where it's it's happening and 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 it's very very vibrant in schools of architecture as of course uh if it's a question of responsibility as as our species uh kills itself off the planet's going to be fine but uh as we do the um kamikaze act uh, ritually i mean a ritual death uh are the, in that moment it, it makes sense that architecture schools think about respon the responsibility and and you know I think I think it's kind of uh, very very exciting and requires much more um, listening by architects to a wider range. But I also noticed that a lot of the leading thinkers in the world of um, you know bacteria and plants and species and so on are very much listening to architects also. So this is really a, a mm -hmm. mutual exchange. Um, that's very much in the spirit of your of your comments. So I think you know, and it's kind of doesn't matter what people who run schools think. <laughs> it never matters. Uh, 
is a force. Mm. That's what I mean. Mm. It's a force that's mm. going to come through this room. It's already here. Some of the most exciting thinkers in this area have been working at the AA for a while. So it's, it's, it's inevitable, right? What it means to think the history of bacteria, right? Like most of us have inside of us bacteria that are millions of years old that are using us as a vehicle. They are the primary. Without them, we are not ourselves. We can't think. The gut-brain relationship is incredibly direct. So if even if you are obsessed with a human, then you should sit down and chat with bacteria. And those bacteria have got a few million years already. So that's immediately we put we put the most current thinking about new design at a leading experimental school of architecture. We have to think three million years just as a starting point. You know, as far as the planet's concerned, three million years, give me a break. It's not even can I say something? Yeah. Um so when I got invitation from you making the, the, the material and the history, I understood this about making actually. I don't know. I'm just I'm bringing back to subject of architecture. I mean, it's so everything is, you know surrounding us has got history, even grass, bottles, water, computers. And uh, I, in, in, in fact, I, I kind of learned that sort of a, the viewpoint from the artist Richard Wentworth. I mean, we had a quite close relationship. So while I was working at 6A, and you know, we invited him for a couple of se seminars in Princeton University of where I teach. His uh, view of the world is amazing. Everything has history. And uh, he sort of speculated, he analyzed them. But uh, it's all about how these things are made, how why these things exist. And uh, I don't know. So, so that's, I think, if we start talking about something else and then somehow diverge from the question of architecture somehow. So I don't know. I kind of uh, wanted to bring this discussion mm. to this sort of aspect of making. Mm. So how you praise the material. Also, um, a, a thought that occurred to me listening to you uh, all was um, the question of timing. That um, I, I feel like the examples I gave are very much practical ones. And maybe practice um, leads one to feel that the most leverage you'll have is to choose the moment in which to react to the circumstance and I wonder whether that's um, th this question of, of history however long its span is what agency do we have at any moment to intervene and I wonder whether also that the, the experience at school is a lot about um, a certain anticipation and I suppose that there's, a, there's a sense that every decision um, the lives we le lead, there's an expectation they're faster and faster, but I suppose there's also, um, in the practice of making things, there is a slowing down too, in which there are moments in which certain outcomes are possible, but they're often, it's only through practice that you learn this, uh, this um, patience, if you like. And uh, I mean, there's almost like a moment in which, I, mean, I think your presentation was very much about um, there's only a right moment for that outcome and it may be fleeting and there's a somehow a kind of um, becoming familiar with the territory in which one has that opportunity. And that also involves um, material the ontological development of time through material. And the architecture actually comes on a ephemeral edge, which if you are an architect, but striving to be an architect, you are aiming towards that sensation of that that moment has arrived. You, you talk about a fleeting moment. It's a timeless moment. And that actually is what people have recognized in architecture historically for a long time. And I would say, going back to certainly beyond the primitive hut, to, I mean, I've always felt that was a sort of like cop out. Um, to God. 
to <laughs> to a, a more Aboriginal way of thinking, where you realize that a line is an absolute myth. Um, that's my contribution. <laughs> I think it's a no, I, I mean, a couple of things. Uh, so seven years to make your project, right? That's that's an average length for a PhD. So, just so his, historians, when they talk about their work, say exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. That there is, you know, they even refer to their material. Mm -hmm. And the craft, the discoveries, the inventions, the loneliness, the frustrations, also the politics, the rules, regulate, you know, this. Stuff. So what's interesting is that there's, if you take these two communities, so-called historians and so-called designers, architects and so on, and you, and you listen, then you realize that it's so similar, mm -hmm. the questions that are being asked. And, and that's a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm a total believer in the Stockholm Syndrome, so I'm just, just <laughs> slapping you again and again, hoping that eventually you go, okay, okay. <laughs> If, hypothetically, because I'm arguing for a biodiversity of history, where what we tend to do is think that you need a few historians, you need some difference, but not too much, and then you need millions of designers to figure out the consequences of that. I'm just saying hypothetically, what if it you actually needed like more, what what if we had a million historians? We might only need a hundred architects because it would have we would have finally figured out. So I just think that the the way schools would tend to be organized is based on a kind of false logic about the way that design benefits from history. And I think the AA is an exception. This is, I'm really trying to say here in this place, there has been for a very, very long time, through a lot of the 175 years, many, many more historians than really can be defended from a kind of budgetary or ideological point of view. That's point, num <laughs> That's point number one. No, but it's point, number one. point number two is, Anyway, what are we talking about? So Jenks's image gets published in the AD, which is being edited at that time by Robert Middleton, who's an architect who then works alongside Archigram making Houston before eventually turning up and, and running general studies here at the school. So is he a historian or an architect or an architect? Like this, you know, the most interesting figures tend to be not easily classifiable. And, and, and this is why I treasure your comment, like I don't necessarily want to be called. And, and, and I think ar architecture, whatever that is, is at its best when it's not classifiable too. So I don't think it's interesting when it's like, a, and this is me, right? I'm not okay. saying everybody should agree, but it's not interesting to me when it's a thing that has a kind of very particular reality, which we need to respect. Because generally when I hear those kind of conversations, I lean forward and say, okay, tell me, what's specifically architectural and really belongs to architecture and nothing else. I hear always what I could hear in, in almost any other situation. So we, of course, as architects, think that there might be something extraordinary there. We may even devote our entire lives to it. But a working definition of an architect would be, for me, somebody who doesn't know what a building is. <laughs> and everybody else knows. Um, <laughs> also why architects tend not to get paid, because you know, there is this problem. And, and, but that's not, not something special. An architect, she will spend her entire life being an architect in order to understand why she is just unable to separate herself from this thing called architecture. To say that an architect is somebody who doesn't know what a building is, it's just the same as the great painters are great because they've never really been happy with what they produce. They never really fully understood the next painting will be the one in which painting will be discovered. So if that's true, if architects, architects are the ones that don't know what architecture is, then an architect school is an amazing place where what you said before, that we don't know what we are doing. That's what we have in common is this. And I think it's a kind of, if it's a bore, if a historian is boring and they can be powerfully uh, boring, they're not listening to architects. And vice versa is also true. Mm -hmm. Architects can, can be just massively uninteresting. And that generally that means they've shut down and in this place, there has been a loss, a lot of infection going on mm -hmm. for a very, very long time. I don't see any reason why it will stop. And in your very panel is highly infectious, not just because this is obviously another COVID spreading evening at the AA, but, but there's a mixture again, you know. Yeah. Yeah, of course.
Thanks, Mark, for advocating for historians and also for architects. A million. A million <laughs> historians. I would start here. No. Um, also, after I've retired, then there can be a middle historians. Um, but I think I just wanted to um, comment a little bit, not necessarily advocating for one or the other, but speaking perhaps a little bit to responsibility. I had hoped to dodge responsibility by studying history. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not possible. And now neither do I want to. Um, I just note, it's just occurred in the last 30 seconds, but for what it's worth, it is Black History Month. Um, I don't really know what you want to attach to that. I did see an article this morning um, in a liberal newspaper that was entitled, like, how much Black history should we be teaching in schools? And um, so I guess looking at history that way is, um, as we've mentioned already today, biased and ever-changing and um, something that is constantly being interpreted and enacted by those who are holding the pens. Um, but going back to architectural materiality, I just want to recall a tiny anecdote with, um, I hope, my friend, the artist Pablo Brunstein. Um, I was working on an exhibition with him about um, Georgian architecture and pseudo-Georgian architecture. We're in mostly Georgian architecture right now. Um, but we were talking about stuff that's built in the late 70s, early 80s, as the 70s again, um, that was kind of pseudo-Georgian, using modern materials to approximate or ape um, a sort of historical materiality. And at a certain point, Pablo just said, you know why I like architecture is because it fucking tries so hard. <laughs> and I think I kept that um, and continue to kind of cherish that sentence because I think that is what keeps me um, in history. And I think that does maybe describe the, the relationship that I enjoy with it because what I'm trying to unpick is what's it trying at? And, and it, it gives me a great empathy with looking at even the material of the past, even you know during Black History Month, even as a person of color, when I can see that what is materially extant is often freighted with a lot of pain and a lot of oppression and a lot of stuff that I would rather not acknowledge. I think um, the, the way that I find empathy with that is to try and understand what is the effort? What is the architecture trying to do? Materially, is it trying to hold up a span that is, hasn't been seen before? Is it trying to embody certain ideas, as we've mentioned? Is it, what's it trying? And what's it trying to do? Is it trying to hold material value by being made of porphyry or what have you? Um, what architecture is trying to do and that effort however flawed and fallible from age to age or day to day or person to person is what's um, so endearingly, heartbreakingly beautiful about it to me. And the more you keep doing that, the more that gives, when I'm wearing my historian hat, the more that gives me the opportunity to have empathy for, and the more that gives me the opportunity to have my own perspective on it. So I guess I just wanted to mention that sentence to you. If nothing else, it's just, um, Pablo just in a sudden, sudden exasperation saying, it's just trying so fucking hard to do something. So I would just, um, I guess I'm just confessing that that's what I'm looking at when I'm looking at architecture. What is, what's being tried so hard? What's this building trying to do? And then I have to consider the responsibility of what I'm trying to do too in looking at it. That was all. I think it's a really, it's a, a lovely phrase. And I think we should all definitely carry it with us. I, I think maybe I just, very briefly want to challenge this idea of when we talk about history. So I think when we kind of came up with this series, it's sort of what motivates you, what drives an approach. And for some people, that architecture comes out of the history or comes out. It's less perhaps about being a historian. I think this is a really, I mean, I've never thought of myself as a historian. I'm just interested in various things and I explore them for a period of time in between other things. And then I suppose the idea of a history and what we teach as an architectural history in particular is also very problematic. It's, it's actually quite rare to teach, as I'm starting to do this year, a survey course. Um, it's, very, it's very unusual to do, be sort of summative in the way in which we look back at the past. However, I think there's a way of approaching the world around us that has a deep understanding with the layers of what have come before 
even if that be the layers of the of the iterations of the Jenks drawing that I call history, that comes not, doesn't spring out of nothing, doesn't spring simply, not simply or even beautifully from intuition, but has a sort of, in, is embedded in some way in a deeper understanding or a desire for a deeper understanding of some kind of condition. And I think that that obviously doesn't sit in opposition to material and in, perhaps this, these two topics are where one place is kind of capital A architecture in that the conversation last night, in fact, I think there was a wonderful comment from or a question from the students is sort of, have we failed in that sort of not making anything? And I think, it, you know, when I, I consider the, some of the really beautiful work that all of you are doing is rooted in an understanding of what has come before. It's interpretive. It's subtle in its interpretation, its observation. It's got a sort of material understanding that isn't a singular understanding. It's not just timber does X and therefore I will make the most of it. It's, it's happenstance, it's economics, it's all these various components that come together in such an extraordinary way. But there are two sides of a coin that make architecture in a way in which we kind of commonly understand it, mm -hmm. which I find really fascinating. And I think has a place, has a really, really important place. And sometimes we're scared to talk about it. So I think that was an incredibly important way, important theme to begin to bring in here, because certainly the legacy of your work, Shin, of various other people in the school has really brought that home. You know, Will, I'm really happy you're here. You know, this is, this is, a, this is a place we make things. We don't, we talk a lot, but we also make things. And we do that and we learn through doing it. And we learn through the kind of iterative discussion between us. So I think that's really what we're trying to get at. Rory. Yeah. <laughs> I'll dive in. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of kind of really nice ideas that perhaps I can kind of weave together a little bit and then use to pin you all to the desk a bit and talk about also the reality of spatial production, which I think we can't escape somehow. And I think this idea of sort of responsibility that's mutually floating around it, we're also in it you know inseparably tethered to and everything that we do and say as architects and teachers and practitioners and learners collectively i think is you know has an impact and we have to take responsibility for it but i think so this idea in a way of uh, i suppose history and material being linked and the material is the kind of physical detritus perhaps that's left that kind of embodies the histories that we have and are then kind of explored and uncovered and recovered kind of later, I think is really lovely. And I think also this idea of kind of architecture in general being something that tries hard is a great way to sort of segue into saying that actually I think most of architecture really doesn't try hard enough. And actually a lot of the way in which cities are made and which spatial production rolls on irrespective of our kind of, you know, conversations in buildings like this, is really not working hard enough at all. And it's massively kind of expropriative. And a lot of it actually also uses history and material as a way to screw people over, right? Like a lot of the things that we're talking about that are a lot more kind of touchy feely that are about kind of trying to find ways of binding things together in order to ground particular identities through those material artifacts and through those histories on the one hand is really rich and enriching, right? That one's identity can be grounded in something spatial that one lives in, the physical traces of those histories kind of lived upon, I suppose. But then at the other end, you know, those linear histories, I suppose, in which we have constructed and which we have invested, at least at, let's say, within the grounds of, you know, kind of latent instruments and structures like the nation state, very powerful kind of identities that are then used to generate whole vast pieces of city, right? That are, because they're made of a particular material, they look a particular way, they inherit a particular formal language and they attempt to house a particular kind of people, inherently disfavor huge quantities of that kind of diverse organogram, right? Of people that make up all of those various kind of components. And humanity is kind of the, critical part in all of this for me which is my cards on the table so in a way I think what I'm trying to get at are two kind of key questions and this a lot of this I think also comes back to the Jenks diagram which I've also done a kind of linear job and it's kind of amazing because in a way I think it charts an evolution in 
a kind of gradual exposure of the latent layers of complexity in the world. I don't think the world has got any more complex, but I think the way in which we kind of process it and we translate it and we communicate it to others has. And the way in which we therefore share our identities in which we pool all of those ideas about space and about the histories that ground our identities just blend naturally kind of over time as part of that. Mm. So to what extent, I suppose, does history matter in the way that we teach, like what we do here in the building now and the way in which we practice now as architects, like to what extent are those things meaningful, really? Because the result of that diagram is, is madness in a way, which is that if you try and find the links between things and you try initially, if your project is the network, then eventually that network becomes so exponentially complex that yeah. you realize somehow you become a nihilist and nothing really matters. And I also think that's fine. So you can disagree, but it's like, I want to know in a way, how does this idea about, how do your ideas about history and how they ground these things that matter, matter to us and what we do and how we practice? And on the other hand, I think, well, maybe it's just one question. <laughs> it's just one question. I mean, okay, I'm just going to, say very quickly and then I, I maybe I might ask Mark to take it on I was thinking of which words first of all I'll um Rory I'm not looking at you because you know what I look like yeah okay cool <laughs> um I yeah um I will bite to the death for your right to say that architecture isn't trying hard enough this the words that I would circle if you're what you said was a piece of writing would be enough uh, maybe humanity those are the critical aspects i think you're bringing to the question because i'd be delighted to validate um you know going back to what i said about architecture trying hard sure there's architecture trying hard to prop up machinations of late capitalism sure there's architecture trying hard to um mask the labor costs of um, certain peoples over others. So the question of it trying hard isn't meant to be um, in any way positive in its undertones, it's meant to be dispassionate. Um, and that's what gives me the kind of empathetic dispassion to be able to look at history and not um, recoil from it, no, nor the future. So I think um, that's all I just wanted to ask Mark, perhaps which words he would have underlined or so. I'm gonna, I'm gonna no, or you could take it on, please. Because I think otherwise it becomes a conversation between the two sure. history people. I think Takeshi, you, your work also in Bermondsey, I think has meaning and is not just what you make there, but your involvement. Yeah, you don't have to go there. But maybe that is this is to me. Um, but be harsh, but in my mind, architecture is very simple. I mean, we should really design good buildings. And the buildings are simple. I mean, you know, made out of things, materials, but it's quite complex. It embodies histories, it embodies narratives, it embodies stories. And probably the biggest thing human beings make, apart from, I don't know, maybe not that, you know, biggest thing, and also probably last long, longest. Um, so, um, that's where I see the potential of architecture lies. And uh, in some way, histories are also part of the materials that you choose to incorporate in your design. Mm. And we, we kind of make, you know, certain sort of uh, choices, you know, that uh, this is very significant, therefore it should be part of the story or part of the design. And uh, that's a sort of a, conscious decision that you make some sort of link to the, to the you know, geographically, also historically, the time. Uh, but that, through that, I think you can make architecture very rich. And I think that's, that's the, I don't know, I mean, job of architect in my mind. So maybe, yeah, I'm not academic, so yeah, those kind of <laughs> theories, I don't quite get it, but, uh, um, does that work for you, Rory? It's a very challenging question. <laughs> no, but I, I, mean, I think it is, it is interesting to, just in terms of what we practice, what we make, to begin to answer that question. Because if, if you're the people who are trying hard enough or not trying hard enough, 
I think, you know, the, maybe the question mm. is also for you. I think that conversation um, made me think of uh, Peter's observation that maybe embodying wasn't really up to date and it's kind of metaphorical tendencies are perhaps slightly outmoded and he was promoting uh, temporality as being more concrete and I wondered whether that, that that is a kind of refreshing a reality in which some things persist and others don't and maybe there's a kind of uh the possibility of a greater appreciation for time in that respect that does allow a certain decoupling of, I mean, I think you you made a, a point of highlighting embodiment as an important part of what's being discussed. But I, I did think that, that um, what Peter presented in that idea was very potent now. Um, well, I'm uh, I'm a little bit uh, jealous that you know if you are uh, if you're interested you're you're working on you know on the history side of architecture you have historians and if you're working with materials there isn't there isn't like a, a special area where you know we can inhabit it's it's just well we make things and. And it's just you know, architecture and the other things. So, yeah. So I I I, I want to I, I want to bring that back because you know, uh, because you know my time at the AA, it's very special. You know, I've always been interested in material, but it, you know that's what I ended up doing. And you know, and this as a school, it's a place where, you know, you can uh, foster that kind of interest, and it's really important. And I hope that it's still happening. In happening in a way that we can have discussion about uh, material, not just you know on the on the, on the surface. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I think about you know how I've always been interested in material, and but it's I fell in love with it in chemistry class. You know, I mm -hmm. I look at it and I thought, oh well, actually, material isn't just this and that. You know, there are little logic and structure that is hidden and and then um that and that's you know for me you know really important but uh finally when i got here and you know thinking about material as an important part of my practice um you know it, the place this place cemented my i guess i guess my love for material as a key part of uh learning about mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. I love that you say it cemented it. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. It was on purpose. Shin, has <laughs> a question. Is there a microphone? Oh, there's one coming. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, John. I shouldn't get any credit from having you to here because it's a little long time ago. But I think following up to Guan, I think it's just from my knowledge, I can just contextualize his project particular, or maybe Akeshi's. I think the, um, you know, that particular area we are looking at the building materials like slate, uh, Portland stone, and any other architectural materials. And we assume that uh, there is history in the material. So Guan's case, I think when you, yeah, yeah. I remember your project, we really look at the kind of, what kind of uh, industrial heritage, post-industrial landscape, but being left behind. And the first act he did is holding all those excess ashes in the yeah, coal fire power plant and very contaminated. Yeah, and he hold it together and try to form something from those unwanted materials as an act of re-appreciating or certain way. So there is actually history, the way you did a project on that particular time in the mid 1990s, nine, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Mm. So I, I think there's something about uh, probably 
history come back to you when you realize that, oh, yes, I've done that, that element we looked at. Then probably architecture is really about recycling what we are given, or maybe materials being left behind. So in a way, eight years building and built, but are we taking responsibility about building after eight years? Or what shall we do with all those excess of buildings we inherited and how we could revalue or re-reading then probably recycling the history itself might be quite uh, exciting. I think they, um, maybe some of the design practice probably demonstrating that possibilities of uh, evaluating somehow. So, <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not sure, maybe should I ask other questions, but whatever. But you know, we have a lot of another series of unit, which actually scientifically or commercial value, or maybe, um, yeah, John's doing more kind of more high-tech environmental chemistry you're talking about, many way to re-evaluating or really question the history itself. So, so maybe. Oh, thank you, Shin, that's, that's beautiful, but thank you. Yeah, I think that that's really good because that's why. Well, is on yeah. One of your first comments was materials is a in process of transformation, and I think, and you talk about chemistry and actually making materials. But then, if you look from the other side of materials uh, transformation, from uh, a tile was a mountain, you know, and the transformation that comes from extraction, and I think that's something uh, a lot in our profession. We just focus on material as something we use but not something that's taken from somewhere else. And I think that's where it links from your question before. And it's not necessarily the natural side versus the making side, but really understanding the material is the thing that links those things that material you can create from chemistry, but a lot of the materials we still use comes from somewhere. And, and what is the, and I think that's the process of the history of the materials, not the history only of the, the value and what the, the value we put, the society value, but it's the history of, you know, that material existed before even was extracted and how it was formed, then that's how we put value. So I think that that's the link that we can think of. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of materiality and history and nature that it's yeah, in this process. And, and this is super interesting what you're saying. And I, I think it um, touches was maybe the urgencies of yesterday referred to because if, if as you say, you think of the history of a material, even if you were gonna stay close to the material and as you said so beautifully to caress it forever it seemed like a good project you know, to keep caress the, the some these histories that are now being written particularly in a, in a kind of attempt to understand what might be a post extractive architecture i think it's really a conceptual problem if if architecture is so complicit with extraction the very idea of a post extractive architecture might be a contradiction in terms there might be, need to be something that comes after after the word architecture right and, and so material, the word material now means something, I would say even like this month, different than it did a month before that. The last five or six years, which have zoomed in on the toxicity of materials, the history of the distribution, the inequities associated under a kind of general umbrella of extraction, let's say, um, is super crucial and urgent, but is changing the way historians work. Because if any historian who now writes about a moment of time, a specific time in a specific culture and specific place has some kind of responsibility to think through what processes of extraction were operational at that time. It's not like the inequities that architecture is complicit were invented yesterday. They, they are really, you know, think of the, the, want to think material, Neolithic. So material was plaster, getting back to the stucco example, architecture, right? Orthogonal architecture detached from the ground is plaster. The plaster required all of the resources of the culture to make, to make the fire, to get the stone. It, it's argued to be the end of the Neolithic, right? So in a certain sense, architecture begins with a material, a specific material, plaster, that was, in, was the first artificial material. So we made, in a way, the material in order to make the architecture. And now we see it so clear in its, also, it's, it drew a line between who's inside and who's outside. So also the kind of inequities of architecture begin with this material act. I make a speech here only because your comment is so important <laughs> because historians can't write now the way they used to write. They learn from those who devote themselves to material. Now, that's the exchange that's so interesting. What, in which way will histories change uh, as a result of, of somebody who says, I will focus my whole life on one material and 
And this is a very, very exciting moment. And it's a little bit of a belated response because I think it was so, so incredibly well formulated what you said that any response looks stupid. I'm happy to be the <laughs> student. But I, but I think it will be, and I don't want to say the check is in the mail, but a little bit I'm saying that, that actually I think the landscape of thinking is changing very fast. And maybe once again, we can, we can, can hit the question that you're asking. I only note as a historian, what you said is exactly what was being said in the 1960s in this room. Mm -hmm. And there was a call, an urgent call for architecture to face its, you know, this is the time of John Turner. Uh, this is a time of uh, awareness of, of ecological disaster. This is awareness of, this is also a big moment in, in, uh, in, um, in, 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 in attention to racism. This is it's a big moment in attention to, to planetary shifts and so on. So basically the same thing, you could have said the same thing then. Now the answer is, is, is different. And, and a, many, many, I would say thousands of people within the so-called architectural world are each contributing a different element to this uh, puzzle. So it doesn't have a single answer, but I really think if you took all of that intelligence that's bubbling up with urgency, because we have a politically motivated student body, right, that just, you know, is really worried about the way things are, you know, the shit that's going down. So if you combine that energy from the students with this new knowledge that's developing from all these different directions, I, I, one could be vaguely optimistic. Yes. <laughs> you know. I, would agree. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's, what you say is that is the, the question into which all of this conversation has to somehow feed, it seems to me, you know? I think, you know, we learn so much from, from, you say you're not an academic, but you're an academic. Yeah. <laughs> you teach exactly. in a school, you focus, you make an experiment, you know, you learn over a long period of time and you infect another generation. So I think as fellow academics, academic in the good sense, um, I think we can be optimistic. I think one last question, Jessica, thank you. Hi, yeah, following on from that, um, maybe, yeah, it's a good um, place for my question because there's been a lot of talk of um, the urgency of the situation and the responsibility that we have in terms of history and material as architects or historians or other others and other collaborators. Um, so I just, and it's great that there are these sort of alternative histories that can challenge the canon and um, open it up to a sort of more inclusive yeah. and um, more generous um, alternative um, ideas and meanings. <clears throat> so um, I just wanted to ask whether there's um, what you what the panel um, considers the role of humor in history and material as a kind of um, <laughs> hopeful uh, space. Yeah. Who wants to jump on that one first? I, I'm not very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. I'm not <laughs> yes. No, it's just um, I really enjoyed the conversation, um, but it seems to me that we're all doomed. You know, if we take the long view, and that um, material is something that is 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 we're, we're all part of the material world. So I mean, the absurdity of the situation, mm. I, I think, and the humour. Mm. I, I kind of detected it in in Guan Li's presentation of of the sort of excavation of space that, that, that you know in architectural terms it freezes and it solidifies and it it, it, it doesn't change after a point. Um, I think Takeshi also showed us the um, the Thomason, which I know a little bit about. These these kind of absurd moments that have happened after the passage of time, but it just I. I just it's a comment and, a, and an observation that it reminds me of a film, which, you know, film is different to architecture, but there was a film called Woman of the Dune, um, which is a Japanese film about a couple of women, a mother and a daughter who are endlessly trapped in, in, in a sand, in, in, a, in, a, in a ditch made by, in a sand dune, and they're endlessly excavating to create their kind of their existence, and I, I think it's a, it's a kind of metaphor, you know, for what we do as architects, because material, e even the most static 
architectural elements are constantly being changed, you know. And there are great examples, I think, of the exhibition here, which um, we talked about Peter Salter, I think, on, on weathering. This notion that mm. this imperceptible change takes place. And, um, you know, that's another kind of, it's just an observation. Mm. No, absolutely. I, I, I'm wondering, if, Peter, if we should bring you back, given we've we've gone to temporality again. Um, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I can be heard, so I'll be very brief. Um, in general, I fear all the great abstractions by which we think we can control reality, history, materiality, as you know, all materials, space time, history even, they all need to be filled with the concrete details. Um, and I worry that we have adopted this, or in adopting this, people who really know about building or making the crafts are treated as a kind of print button in, you know, Rhino or BIM or whatever. And I, what I, I, I think a, a, a much more generous metabolism needs to be imagined. It's probably more messy, but one useful metaphor is Colin McFarlane's notion of learning a city. It's too larded up with sociological jargon in, in print, but the basic idea is to see from the city, how people, from the city's point of view, how different kinds of understanding um, mature, ranging from, you know, where do I get bread through how can a women's cooperative organize international support for their housing in, um, as, it, as it then happened in Bangladesh, um, to, you know, planners and, you know, people like us at conferences speculating. Um, if one thinks of the, the need to bring aboard a common commitment in the face of what's a common crisis, the nature of it, <clears throat> one doesn't get into words like intelligence or knowledge. It's, it's, again, a much more concrete, much more ambiguous phenomenon that is full of, you know, every encounter will be conflict, accommodation, or negotiation, accommodation, and, you know, occasionally collaboration. And I think it's going to be both that concrete and that messy, but I certainly agree with the optimists, or I, otherwise you may as well go off and be somebody else's food. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, I think we're just getting slightly thinner, and I'm wondering whether we sh maybe there's one last comment, and perhaps we can continue this over a glass of something I more informally. Slightly, and and that just to answer Jess's question about humour, and I'm not very funny, but um, as as Mark and I both advocated for history being very funny, I mean architecture is a profession that is. I guess, been conceptualized in the West for a few hundred years, no, 600 years, perhaps? More than that, more than that. And existed as a thing that people do for several thousand years, but still doesn't know how to charge for the thing that it does. That's pretty funny. Come on. If you weren't involved in it, that's pretty funny. You could make a tragic sitcom about that. I say that with lots of empathy. I have all this knowledge and I teach, so I'm really not, you know, throwing stones here. But, um, a profession that doesn't know how to charge for itself, I think is in a dark way, quite funny. Many of the, I guess it's a knife um, humor and, and a refuge as well for all of you, because the things that we're dealing with is are often not very funny. Um, but for instance, we've mentioned several times this evening, I'm sorry for those of you who are bored of these references, but Charles Jenks was hilarious. And if you walk around his house, it's full of really terrible dad jokes and puns and um, material humor. Um, Peter Cook might be an example of somebody whose work was considered fun and funny at the time, perhaps not all of it has aged as well. 
because humour is something that shifts. And I guess cheesy classic historian point to make, humour, humility and humanity are sharing things, aren't they? So I think, yeah, useful knives and refuges, I think. Good. Um, I think that might be a good time to wrap up, have a glass of glass of wine. I think I'd like to take your humor and add delight, which is of particular importance to me. And on that note, I want to thank my panelists for an absolutely fantastic evening and all of your contributions as well.